okay yeah um so yes good morning to all of you um i don't know either people are just quiet or they are very sad or they are tired i'm trying to analyze the emotions over here uh but i just hope it's not sadness or tiredness um yeah you know monday mornings i know can be a little draining uh, so yes um we were covering the historical books we looked at uh, the books of samuel we looked at kings we looked at chronicles we only have one historical book left uh, which is the book of esther and then hopefully we will be able to start off with the poetic books uh, the books which are generally called the wisdom books uh, they are mainly poetic books so um, we'll try to cover one poetic book today and we'll of course also finish off this last historical book of esther uh, so hopefully esther will cheer you all up a little bit and bring some happiness into your monday morning all right so yeah we'll um, begin uh, now if we look at the book of esther one main thing that we see is um, even though the name of god is not mentioned even once in this entire book we see god completely in control completely at work in every single event that takes place in this book um on the other hand in this book you have the king's name and haman's name mentioned multiple times they are the ones doing all the actions they are the ones taking all the decisions but the person who is actually in charge of what's going on is god even though he is not mentioned uh so that's the beauty of this book we see the love of god where he cares about his people who are living in a foreign land and we see his sovereignty he is in full control of the situation even though um, you know the there are powerful people working against the israelites uh, we see that god is fully in control okay so um, even as we look at the book of esther Uh, we should see it as a book offering encouragement okay because um, even in our uh, current scenario the church is living in an age in an era where we have powerful influential people at work you know if you look at our news channels today you're going to hear the names of politicians you're going to hear the names of uh, you know very rich influential people you are not going to hear any of them mentioning the name of jesus you know in in our news channels but even though the these influential people are the ones doing all the actions they are the ones taking all the decisions there's somebody who is not even being mentioned but he is behind the scenes and he is fully in control so even as we see the things which are happening in our world today it is good for us to remember this the influential people they talk they act they decide but there's somebody behind the scenes and he is the one who is actually in sovereign control and we see that reality coming out in this uh, book of esther um so um where exactly is this entire story situated what's the location of this entire event which is happening all of this is taking place in the capital city of susa uh, in the persian kingdom if uh, you remember uh, when the uh, when the when the people of juda sinned against god uh, the lord allowed the babylonians to come and capture them and the people were taken as captives uh, uh, to um, to babylon and from babylon during those 70 years of exile the jewish people start spreading out to many other uh, regions so they don't all stay in babylon they move out and they go to many many different places so you have some people coming over here to the persian territory and you know you have um, them settling down in different places so um, nehemiah is one of those people he uh, he's either born over there or uh, uh, you know um, 
or he 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 already comes over there as a grown up we do not know but he assumes a position of authority in the capital of susa uh, so um, so now we have people living even in this persian territory and this particular story is taking place in you know in this uh, city uh, so we have many details regarding this particular king the king who chooses to marry esther we have more details about him uh, more historical details about him because of an ancient writing uh, which is available a greek author named herodotus he wrote about um, uh, king zeres okay that's the that's the greek name which herodotus gives to this particular king um, the other name which is generally used for this king is ahasuerus so ahasuerus is more the traditional name that is given to this king uh, but then herodotus in his historical records he always refers to this particular king as king zeres uh, so uh, he gives many details about this particular king and we get to know that um, uh, when zeres comes to the throne uh, he suffers from a lot of rebellion from the babylonians you know who have been conquered but still they are they are rebelling and they are creating a lot of confusion in his land so when he comes to the throne he has a tough time putting down all of their uh, you know um, uh, all of their attacks all of their rebellions so uh, all those things are recorded in the uh, in the in that historical book which um, herodotus has written so egyptian egyptians also were creating confusion for uh, this king so that is why when haman comes to king zeres and says you know there's this entire race of people the jews and they are dangerous they can create a very serious rebellion because they are all over our land and you know they can create havoc Uh, because their customs are very different they follow a different god and so when haman comes and instigates the king the king is more open to what haman is saying because of the kind of uh, political scenario that this man was facing already he's having much trouble from the egyptians he's been having trouble from the babylonians so under those circumstances he certainly doesn't want problem now from the jewish people as well and that is why he is so open to whatever haman you know says uh, to him so we need to understand this uh, political background that is there you know running uh, in this uh, story another thing that we get to know through the uh, historical records of herodotus is that um, uh, zeres has this desire to conquer greece and so uh, he goes to the greek capital is able to capture that place for a little while uh, for for a few years and uh, so he decides to establish a palace over there and you know establish his political control over there in greece but then the greeks are too powerful uh, he is unable to hold on to his position over there and so after a few years he is defeated he has to come back Uh, you know the greeks are able to take back their city and he is not successful in his attempt so the story of vashti you know the queen who refuses to come and um, honor him by you know meeting with all of his guests uh, that event takes place before he goes on his greek campaign uh and so he's very angry he's very upset that vashti is not uh, you know honoring him in front of all of his guests and he dismisses her as the chief queen and uh, in that frame of mind he goes for his greek campaign he's able to succeed that makes him feel good about himself he stays over there for a while but then the greek uh, uh, army is able to take back the capital and so he comes back home in a defeated state he is in a rather uh, bad mood he is not very happy with the way things are going so now he thinks it would be so nice if he can have a new distraction so all he is looking for is a new distraction not so much for a wife to love and honor but just another new chief queen you know uh, because those that's the way those kings functioned in those days so in this kind of a scenario 
uh, Esther is chosen and uh, you know she is selected to become the chief queen. Uh, so looking at the structure of this book of Esther, we can say that chapters one and two um, are one section because that's basically where we see um, Esther being chosen. Uh, and um, we have, you know, uh, Esther chapter 2, verse 17, where it says, The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness with him. God causes the heart of this king to be moved so that he shows kindness to Esther, so that he considers her as favorable. So God helps her in getting favor. All right, uh, and chapters three and four is basically where you have the plot being formed by Haman to destroy the Jewish people, and um, and so it is in chapters three and four that Mordecai comes to Esther and he says, "God has placed you in this position of power, so now you must do something to help your people, you know, the Jewish people." And um, uh, this is what he says, in fact, in chapter four. If we can have someone read out for us, um, Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Esther 4, verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from one another, from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Okay, we, when we look at this uh, words which Mordecai speaks to Esther, he does not have any doubt of how, about how God will help them. He is 100% sure that God will rescue them. But all he is saying to Esther is, you can get a chance to play a part in this. Are you willing to do that? If you refuse to play your part, God will find some other method of rescuing us. But you, you will perish. So the choice that he's placing before her is something great is going to happen. God is going to rescue his people. You can choose to be a part of that and play a role in it. Or you can just simply, you know, uh, choose not to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, that's a lesson that applies to the church today, even as we are undergoing persecution in so many places. We can either choose to play a part in what God is doing, or we can stand back and say, no, I think I'll just watch out for my own interests and, you know, uh, refuse to take a stand for the Lord. So the Lord ultimately will do what he wishes to do for his church. His plans and purposes will be established no matter how much opposition there is. God will have his way. But will you and I get a chance to have a role to play? That is our choice. If we say, Lord, yes, I wish to take a stand. Yes, I wish to do something for the church in this time of persecution. That's a personal choice that we choose to make. Uh, and so here Esther, in fact, agrees and she says, yes, I am willing to do something for the Lord. And so I know that should be even our own attitude and our own stand, uh, you know, in our present age. Uh, so chapters three and four is basically where the plot uh, uh, is hatched by Haman to harm the people. And uh, Esther agrees to help. Um, in chapters five to ten, that's the last section. That's basically where she's able to approach the king. And she's able to, uh, you know, destroy the plan which Haman had. Uh, so Haman's uh, plan to destroy the Jewish people is not uh, successful. So uh, chapters 5 to 10 can be the third section. Um, now, as a, uh, when, when we look at the very uh, last portion of Esther, uh, the, uh, we, we see in, I think it was in chapter 9 or chapter 10, we get to know that a festival of Purim is instituted in honor of the deliverance which God brought to the people. You know, uh, if someone could look up in your Bible and tell me which is the reference, is it in chapter 9 or is it in chapter 10? 
somewhere at the end of one of those chapters it's mentioned saying that uh, as a you know in in honor of what god did this festival was instituted okay so in chapter 9 is where it is recorded so why was this particular festival called the festival of purim it's because of that particular word the persian word puru that persian word puru basically means lots um now in english you know we maybe we would use, we would use the term paper paper chits you know so um if they want to choose a leader they would write the names of maybe three four persons in in paper chits and then of course they did not have paper but you know they would use something else i mean uh, uh, they would they would inscribe the name on something else and use that so lots were cast so they would either put a, put the, put all the names in a cup shake the cup and then you know uh, the first one which falls out that will be the one which is chosen in the, so over here um, the the lots are cast by haman we see that in esther chapter 3 verse 7 he is trying to choose the date on which the uh, jewish people will be destroyed so the lots are cast to find out which should be the appointed day on which the jewish nation is completely going to be destroyed from the persian kingdom uh, so um it was their belief that when they use this system of casting lots the their gods the persian gods would 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 give their decision through the correct you know uh, through the through the correct chit which falls out from the cup they shake the cup and whatever falls out that according to them is what the gods have chosen so um, haman uses that particular method um, if we could have someone read out esther chapter 3 verse 7 esther 3 7 in the throne of the king of the earth in the first part one of these the fruit is the lord first gives in the presence of the man the celebrity and the lord fell out the lord upon the man of allah all right so here it says that the lots were cast in the presence of haman so the priests would have come they would have cast the lots and this particular day was selected for the destruction of the jewish people but on that particular day you know we know the, if if we know the story we 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 learn that on that same day which the evil one had chosen for destruction on that same day uh, you know uh, god instigates the king so that the king says on that day the people will be allowed to defend themselves and they will have victory so we have all the jewish people uh, able to fight back and on that day rather than destruction there is great victory all the enemies who wanted to defeat them and kill them they get killed instead so there's a great deliverance which takes place so even though the lot was cast for something evil god chooses that particular day for a great deliverance you know again there is a learning in this you know the evil one selects certain days certain seasons you know to bring destruction into our lives into our families but that very same uh, things which he has chosen you know those days can be turned into days of victory if we choose to trust in the lord if we say lord i know that what the season that i am going through right now it's a season of great difficulty and the evil one is trying to bring harm to me and my family but i am looking to you in the same way that you delivered the jewish people in that time lord you turn around what the evil one is trying to do and you cause victory lord to come out of this situation rather than destruction so if when we turn to the lord in faith in that way what has been chosen for destruction will instead turn into an event that brings great deliverance and great victory and glory to the lord's name okay so um, um so in that way the feast of purim uh, you know uh, comes into existence um now uh, one thing that is generally told about the book of esther you know very proudly all the indians say that india is mentioned in 
the book of Esther. Uh, but I mean, when it when we actually look at the geographical details, it's not actually India, at least not the current India, which is mentioned in Esther chapter one, verse one. Uh, so it says in Esther one one, uh, this is what happened during the time of Zerus, the Zerus who ruled over one twenty seven provinces, stretching from India to Kush. So over here, when it says India, it's actually talking about the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's talking about the northwestern um, region of Pakistan, where you had the Indus Valley. You know, those of us who have done Indian history, we are familiar with the Indus Valley civilization. That's basically in your northwestern Pakistan. So this king, Zeris, was so powerful that his um, kingdom extended all the way up to the northwestern province of Pakistan. So when it says India, it's actually referring to the Indian subcontinent. Okay, so um, the other extreme is you know, at the other end, uh, the western end, uh, it's extending all the way up to Kush. Now, Kush is basically in Egypt. So all the way from Kush in Egypt up to the northwestern province of Pakistan, this, king, this man's kingdom you know, was extending over that huge area. All right. Uh, so this was a very powerful king. And this king, he chooses to appoint uh, as one of his main officials, uh, he appoints Haman as his in charge, uh, as one of his main uh, officials. Um, so some commentaries, they say that uh, Haman was referred to as the Kiliak. Uh, C H I L I A R C H. A Kiliak is basically uh, a commander of thousand. Uh, so he's like the one of the topmost military officials. So that is basically the position given to Haman. And uh, so uh, the order is given that everyone should show respect to Haman and they should bow down before him. And um, uh, we learn that uh, Mordecai refuses to do that. So we see in Esther chapter 3 that after Haman is instituted in that powerful position of, of, of Kiliark, everyone shows him uh, you know, respect, bows down to him, but Mordecai refuses to do that. Um, there are people who say that Mordecai did not bow down because he he believed that we should bow down only to God. But then nobody was really bowing down to um, Haman as worship. They were doing it more as a, it's a cultural thing. I mean, in our Eastern um, culture, uh, we, you know, we, we bow down to show respect, not because we are worshiping that person or anything of that sort. Um, because, I mean, uh, we see that in many on many occasions in the old testament even the jewish people followed this cultural custom of bowing down out of respect um, if maybe we could have someone read out genesis chapter 33 verse 3 and look at the amount of bowing down which takes place over here in genesis 33 verse 3 if someone could read out Here it's talking about Jacob. Jacob is going uh, towards Esau and he bows down seven times to the ground. Now he's definitely not doing this to worship Esau. It's just an act of uh, respect that he's you know, showing uh, to his elder brother, um, especially because he wants to win his favor. Uh, so, um, bowing down was a cultural practice of showing respect and Mordecai refused to give Haman this respect. Why? What was the, um, you know, uh, what was the reason that he was so stubborn? Why he refused to show respect to Haman? Um, just a minute. Yeah, there's a very relevant question uh, asked over here. Uh, by Shubo, Shubo Ghosh. Oh, that sounds very Bengali. I think maybe you're, you have a Bengali background. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, 
this person's uh, question is, uh, you know, especially in North India, is it all right to, you know, bend down and touch the feet of your elders to show them respect? Yes, it is true that when this custom was first instituted, it was meant as an act of worship where you're supposed to worship your elders as though they are gods above you. Okay, but um, I don't think anybody even thinks of this custom in terms of worship anymore. This is just a purely cultural thing that we do just to show respect. So um, if somebody is coming from another you know, uh, background, religious background, and uh, if they suddenly stop showing respect to their elders, it will create a very bad impression. So yes, I would say, please continue to show respect to your elders by you know uh, bowing down and touching their feet. You're not doing it to worship them. That is simply not the implication at all. You're just doing it out of worship. In the same way, Jacob over here bowed down seven times to the ground as he was approaching Esau in our Indian culture. We would you know bow down to touch the feet of our elders if you're from that kind of a cultural background if you're not from that kind of a cultural background it's not even necessary so i would just say that as part of a as a cultural practice it is all right because if you if if a new believer stops showing respect for elders then it will create a very wrong impression in fact those people will in fact start thinking oh is that what christ teaches that uh, that uh, you know the these youngsters should not show respect to their elders we don't want any that kind of wrong implications coming out okay so yes as a cultural practice it's quite all right to show respect to our elders by touching their feet and we are not going to be doing it as any as any kind of act of worship so coming to mordecai and um, and why he refuses to bow down to haman um, maybe we can just quickly look at the details. Um, we would. It's it's a it's a rather you know um, long background story. Uh, Exodus chapter seventeen verses eight to fifteen. Over there, we get to know that there is a race of people called the Amalekites. After the uh, you know Israelites cross the Red Sea and come to the other side. The Amalekites come and attack them. The poor Israelites have not done anything. They are very happy that God has saved them, rescued them, and they're just minding their own business. And the Amalekites take advantage of these helpless people and they come and attack them. And so at that time, you know, you have uh, uh, Moses standing with his hands raised up and then God gives them victory. All of that takes place. So ever since then the amalekites were enemies of the people of israel and then we learn something in first samuel chapter 15 verses 1 to 3 there god speaks to saul and god says i want you to attack these amalekites and destroy everything that belongs to them and the lord also says put to death the men and the women and the children and the infants so the lord says if all the people and their positions must be destroyed but Saul you know as we know he was greedy he and his uh, soldiers did not want to destroy the valuable cattle and so they saved the cattle and they also saved the king and this is the name of that king in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 9 we get to know uh, it says but Saul and the army spared Agag who was the king of the Amalekites. So Agag, uh, A-G-A-G, -A -G, yeah, is, is the man's name. Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And now when we come to Esther chapter 3, verse 1, we get to know that Haman is the son of Hammedatha, the Agagite. So that is the background. Haman is an Amalekite, a descendant of this king Agag. And so Mordecai does not want to show him respect because Mordecai is a self-respecting Israelite. He's a Benjamite and he does not want to uh, bow down to Haman, who is an Amalekite, who has been an, you know, because the Amalekites are enemies of the Israelites. And so he refuses to do that. And um, this is what the people say um, to, uh, you know, Haman. 
um, Esther chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Uh, if someone could read out for us, Esther 3, verses 3 and 4. In fact, even 5 and 6. Yeah, Esther 3, from verse 3 up to verse 6, please. <laughs> All right. So uh, here we see that um, in verse four, the it says, therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. For he had told them he was a Jew. So they just want to see what Haman's reaction will be when he gets to know about this. So they go and tell Haman, you know what, this is official named Mordecai is a Jewish person and he refuses to bow whenever you, you know, whenever, whenever you're passing by. We've told him again and again that he should do it, but he refuses to do it. And you know what? He's a Jew. So they're just deliberately instigating Haman. And so this is Haman's response. When it says in verse five, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down to pay him honor, he was enraged. And then it says in the next verse, yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. So once he gets to know that Mordecai is a Jew, you know, he's, he decides, where's the point in only killing this one Jew? Let me kill the entire race. Because, you know, there's this enmity between the Amalekites and the Israelites. So he, he scorns the idea of killing only one single person. He decides, let me wipe out the entire race. Okay, so now the question is this. Uh, there's no answer given, no clear answer given in the Bible. But the question is this. Was it a wise decision of Mordecai to refuse to just show respect to the official? If he had done that, he would have... There would have been no crisis. The Jewish people would not have gotten into trouble in any way. Now, we do not know whether he was justified in, in, you know, in opposing Haman in this way or not. But in the New Testament, we do have an instruction being given by uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 20. Matthew 10, 16 to 20. This is the advice that the Lord Jesus gives he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. So the Lord says, be very careful in your interactions with these wolves. You're like sheep and I'm sending you out among these, the wolves of this world. So be very, very wise. Be careful how you deal with them. Be on your guard. And the Lord goes on to say, you know, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them. So when you're standing in front of them and you have to witness to them about me, be wise in the way you're doing it. And, um, you know, he, he, you know he, he comforts them. He tells them, don't worry what, you know, at that time, you don't worry about what you have to say because the Holy Spirit will help you to say the right words. So, um, 
Paul followed, Apostle Paul followed this policy. Whenever he met, you know, with Festus, the governor, and all these other Roman, uh, you know, top, uh, uh, you know, officials and uh, uh, leaders, he always spoke to them most respectfully. He never, um, uh, he, he never instigated them unnecessarily, you know. So we see Apostle Paul being very uh, diplomatic in the way he dealt with these leaders. And uh, in fact, even in the Old Testament, the advice which Jeremiah gives to the exiles who have gone to Babylon, you know, Jeremiah sends a letter to them, to the, to the exiles who have gone to Babylon, and he, and he writes to them in Jeremiah 29, verse 7. He says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Uh, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So even in um, the book of Jeremiah, the advice which the Lord gives through Jeremiah to these people in Babylon is live over there in peace. Don't unnecessarily create riots and rebellions. So was Mordecai justified in, in deliberately instigating Haman by refusing to bow? Uh, we do not know. If the Lord himself told him, do not bow, then yes, he is totally justified in not bowing down to Haman. But he, if he was just simply acting out of his own you know, thinking, then maybe it was not a very wise thing to do. He got an entire nation into trouble by doing that. So today, when we are living in difficult times, when we are living in the midst of persecution, let us be, like you know, Jesus says, let us be as shrewd as snakes, and as innocent as doves. Let us not be um, sinful or crooked or, you know, hypocritical. Let us be innocent as doves, but also let us be as, as wise as snakes. Let us be careful like Apostle Paul in the way we deal with the authorities, you know, who are non-Christians, so that we don't create problems for the entire church. This action of Mordecai brought havoc upon the heads of the entire nation. You know, people who had not done anything uh, harmful, now they were, you know, at the risk of death because of the actions of this one man. So we as believers must be careful in our conduct. And it, I think it is good to be respectful in our conduct and not unnecessarily instigate those who are in authority. All right? So... Um, that's just my viewpoint, of course, you know, so you have you have the total freedom to have a, another opinion. That's that's totally all right. OK, moving on very quickly to um, Esther and the role that she played in all of this. Um, how much time do we have? It's always a fight for time in this class. Um, OK, you know, Esther was living in a very privileged position. Uh, because she had be she had been made the new chief queen of a very powerful nation. I mean, imagine this was an empire which was extending all the way from Egypt up to the borders of the Indian subcontinent. I mean, this was like a really vast nation. And, um, um, you know, uh, in chapter one, it talks about that, uh, that you know, that grand uh, one-month function which this king throws. And it talks about how all the people, uh, you know, it says in verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about uh, how the people were sitting on, um, on couches made of gold and silver. And in the you know, historical records of Herodotus, we get to know that these couches, you know, the, these, these chairs which were made of gold, it was not just gold coating, they were actually made of solid gold. Because when, uh, when um, you know, Zerus goes to, uh, to Greece to conquer that, uh, the capital city, you know, uh, once they are able to um, establish themselves over there, they, they bring some of their things from Persia. And they actually bring solid gold couches and, you know, um, uh, chairs to sit on. And Herodotus records this. So this man, Zerus, was that rich, extremely rich. And Esther is, has become the chief queen of that kind of a nation. So she's in a rather powerful, comfortable position. And now Mordecai is asking somebody like her 
to put her entire life at risk, her entire future at risk. And um, so uh, he says, you know, go and appeal to the king on behalf of your people. And this is what Esther says. So I think we need to look at that. Um, Esther chapter 4, verse 11, if someone could read out. Esther 4, verse 11. All the Whoever started reading first, yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put to put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. Okay, so Esther points out, you know how risky it is for me to try and go to the king's court without having got prior permission. Uh, if I do that, there's a chance that, you know, he may actually have me killed. Uh, and so one point that she makes in the very last sentence, for 30 days, the king has not even asked about me. So which means at the moment, he's found some other distractions. At the moment, he's not really interested in me. So now, when he has not even shown any interest in me for the last 30 days, if I go into the court without any permission, the chances are that I may get killed. So you see, she is actually at risk. And uh, we get to know in, you know, in the, through those historical records of Herodotus that only seven uh, noble families were allowed to freely go into the court whenever they want. Okay, so if you're a member of one of those seven royal families, now they're, you know, they're, I think they're part of the aristocracy. So those seven families are allowed to go into the king's presence whenever they wish. Apart from that, if anyone wants to go, they first have to go to the Kiliark and get permission to see the king. And who is the Kiliark over here? Haman. She can't possibly go to Haman and say, you know, I want to approach the king because Haman will ask, why do you want to go and see him? What do you want to see him about? And she can't obviously tell about, you know, how she wants to destroy his plan to kill the, uh, to the, to kill the Jewish people. So she cannot do that. She cannot take the legal procedure of approaching the Kiliar, getting permission and then going and seeing the king. She just has to do it without any permission. And there's a risk involved because the king has not been showing any interest in her, you know, in, in the in the recent past. So she takes that risk and she says, all right, you know, everyone please fast and pray for me. And if I perish, I perish. So that is the beautiful stand that she takes. Because sometimes when we take a, you know, stand for the Lord, yes, great miracles happen and the Lord saves us miraculously. But then there are some who became martyred, you know, so not everyone had a miracle rescuing them. So Esther decides, maybe the Lord will do a miracle and I will be saved. On the other hand, maybe the, I would have, I will have to martyr my life. Either way, I'm willing to take a stand for the Lord. And so she decides to play her role. So we all have this choice. We can stand on the sidelines and just watch. Or we can say, no, I want to be part of what God is doing. And if I perish, I perish. So be it. So uh, it's a choice that Esther makes over here. And we too are called upon to, you know, um, uh, to take that step. And so we see that in this particular case, uh, the king, he shows favor. So he chooses to extend his golden scepter. So when he extends his golden scepter towards that person, it means that, yes, I'm willing to listen to what you have to say. You know, so she's, uh, she gets a uh, favorable treatment from him. And, um, you know, I mean, we know the rest of the story, how uh, uh, it is Haman who gets hung on the pole, which he has prepared for the hanging of Mordecai. So he prepares this pole for Mordecai to be hanged or upon it, but instead he's the one who ends up being hung on it. Uh, so God turns everything around. Uh, 
so we see god's sovereign control over the entire situation um um and his love and faithfulness towards the people even though they were living in exile why were the people in exile first of all it's an act of punishment of divine judgment the people had not been faithful to the lord they had gone to such an extent that the temple was in disrepair the they did not even have a copy of the of the book of the law in their hands they had forgotten about the the sacrifices of the lord and due to their terrible sin god sends them into punishment into exile but while they are living in exile he continues to be faithful towards them god never punishes his people because he hates them god never punishes his people because you know he wants to destroy them he only punishes people as discipline in the hope that they will humble themselves and come back to him so you know this is a a beautiful uh, you know um, a message to remember when the lord is disciplining us for something that we have done you know we may think that god is angry now god will not care about me anymore god will hate me no whenever god disciplines he is disciplining not to destroy us but to give us a chance to humble ourselves and come back to him so here these people who were living in exile people like mordecai people like esther the you know nehemiah all these faithful people who chose to repent and humble themselves and stay true to god these people even though they were in exile they rose up to top positions god blessed them god protected them god used them for his purposes so uh, uh, we never have to feel condemned when god disciplines us he only discipline disciplines us for our own good you know so um, these are some of the lessons that we can learn from the book of esther uh, so um, yeah maybe you know we can uh, leave early for the, for our break unless of course someone has any question if anyone wishes to raise a question you can do so Were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were they? Uh, you know, when they refused, they refused to bow down to the image of the king. Was that right or wrong? Now that was clearly for worship. The image was constructed uh, as though he is a deity, as though he is a god, and uh, so obviously, if they had bowed to that. that would be an act of worship that would not be a cultural practice at all uh, because very clearly uh, you know he declares himself to be a god and he wants to be worshiped uh, so yeah we will not we cannot compare that with this here um, when uh, jacob bowed down to esau and uh, when uh, you know uh, the people of offic officials were bowing down to haman it was more a cultural practice rather than uh, treating haman as a deity in fact the king would have been very upset if haman had declared himself to be a deity so no uh, the scenarios would be uh, different all right uh, so we'll take our break now and um, you know because basically the bell has gone off over here so yeah go ahead